Well, good evening, everybody. And good evening, everybody else. <laughs> Did you have a good day? Yes. On a scale from one to ten, how was your day? Somebody said one? I'm sorry. Anybody else? Do I have a two? A ten? Somebody had a ten. That's nothing, bro. Mine was 13. <laughs> on a scale from one to 10, because I had eggs benedict, a blueberry muffin, a spinach feta cheese something or other muffin, two muffins in one day. I had a good day. <laughs> it was great. Eating is one of my favorite things to do. I hope you enjoy eating. Do you enjoy eating? I'm the only one? That's not our topic tonight, so let's move on. I want you to pray with me because our subject is one of supreme importance that uh, I would like special intervention from the Spirit of God on my behalf and on your behalf so that we can really wrap our minds and our hearts around what I regard to be one of the most significant truths of the gospel. So please allow me to pray one more time. Father in heaven, God, please intervene on our behalf right now. We want to confess that we're weak, we're fragile, we're broken. And so there are things about you, Lord, that escape our notice. There are things about you we don't know. There are things about you we think we know that we're certain of that are patently false. And so often, Lord, we are intellectual believers and emotional atheists. We know things about you, but God, I pray right now that we would see you in such a light that we would not only know things about you intellectually, that, that Lord, we would fall in love with you that we would sense a deep affection for you arising in our hearts, that we would not only love you as a matter of principle, Lord, but that we would like you, that we would like what we see in your character. So please help us to that end in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to begin our time tonight by introducing to you what for me is one of the most remarkable books I've ever read. Now, the title of the book alone is pretty fascinating and really encapsulates the entire point of the thesis of the book. You'll notice the title is The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Not exactly a thousand, of course. This is a poetic mechanism for suggesting that there is a continuity down through history in all of the stories and the myths that we tell ourselves that there is a single, solitary kind of hero figure that rises over and over again. And while down through history the names are changed and the circumstances are altered, there are similarities that are so uncanny that you can only come to the conclusion, according to Joseph Campbell, you can only come to the conclusion that in fact, Human beings are telling the same story over and over and over again. Now, what he's done, remarkably, is he has traced this continuity, this hero with a thousand faces, through pretty much every culture down through history. He's, he's looked at Egypt and Babylon, Media Persia, Greece. He's looked at the Inca culture, the Aztec culture. He's looked all over the world, and he said, wait a minute, something's going on here. Because these people, and this is before the internet, they're obviously not cross-pollinating their ideas. People from all through history, down through the ages, for some reason, are coming up with exactly the same basic pattern of thought and investing their heroes with the same basic characteristics. Now, that's a pretty provocative premise for a professor of literature to come forward and say, wow, I've read everything in the world, pretty much, and everybody is saying exactly the same thing. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you this evening is there is one outlier story, so hold on to that. Because if you think Joseph Campbell's thesis is provocative, we're going to discover something tonight that is so provocative that it is literally groundbreaking for our understanding if we will get it this evening. So here's what Joseph Campbell says. He says that there is this, this what he refers to as mankind's one great story. Well, there aren't two or three or four or five he's suggesting. He's saying there's just basically one story that we're telling ourselves over and over again. And he calls it also 
he calls it the timeless vision of the human mind, okay? So, so it doesn't matter where you, you drop the pin, as it were, in history. If you analyze the myths and the stories, and then you pick up that pin and you drop it somewhere else in time, the vision is timeless. The names are different. The circumstances are changed. But the basic characteristics of the story is the same over and over and over again. And he poses a question. He says in the book, from what profundity of the mind does it, this universal vision, this universal story, from what profundity of mind does it arise? He, he, he's, he's saying to us here that, that there's something going on in human psychology universally that is giving rise to this repeated myth. There's something that is producing this, you see. There's no Google for everybody in the world to search and to say, that's a cool story. I think I'll tell it with different names over here. These are people separated by vast swaths of time and by land masses, and somehow, out of their collective psychology, everybody's coming up with the same story. It's odd, to say the least. It has a supernatural feel to it, in fact. But he's saying, well, it's not supernatural, it's something going on in the human psyche. So then, he goes a little bit further and he says, why is mythology everywhere the same beneath its varied, its varieties of costume? Do you hear what he's suggesting here? He's, say, he's saying this is just really weird. Why is it the same everywhere, everywhere, everywhere? Now, there are two specific characteristics and I'm going to name them. And these two characteristics are really very, very consistent down through history, and here they are. This is the universal narrative, the universal story that human beings are telling themselves over and over again. The universal story has a number of characteristics that repeat over and over again, but the two prominent characteristics are what I'm going to refer to, this is my language, not the language of Professor Campbell, my language, but deriving from his research, okay, in order for us to understand what's going on here. The universal narrative has characteristic number one, a power over others orientation. Power over. Secondly, it's a power over orientation in which the hero of every myth uses force, coercion, violence to fight his enemies. Or, over and over again, in every story, check this out, Every hero in every myth is portrayed as fighting, get this, evil with the same exact principles that are inherent in the evil they're fighting. Some of you caught that. So there's no difference in character. There's only a difference in scale. You'll see what this means in just a moment. For example, even in our superhero myths, currently, I mean, my whole childhood, I grew up with Superman and Batman and Spider-Man and all the other men, and then that one chick there, what's her name, Wonder Woman. So, so we have this universal myth, and all of these heroes, and then we have the modern variations here with Iron Man and, and uh, the others, Thor, and, and, but all of these stories have something in common. All of these characters that you see on the screen, in all of these stories, all of these characters are the good guys. I'm going to just pause for effect. Do you feel the effect? Once you feel the effect, say amen. Then I'll move on. Okay. What's going on here? These are the good guys in the story. Now, another professor of world religions, who is currently deceased, um, Walter Wink, has also noticed this pattern through history, and he says, he coined a term, <laughs> he's the guy who came up with, if you've ever heard this term, those of you who are familiar with my preaching at all, you will have heard this over and over and over again, because I talk about it a lot, but if you've ever heard the term, the myth of redemptive violence, it derives from Walter Wink. Walter Wink coined the term to describe something. He said, okay, like Campbell, he's saying there's something going on down through human history. 
And the thing that's going on is the myth of redemptive violence. That is to say, violence that produces a redemptive or a positive effect. And so he describes it and he says the belief, the myth of redemptive violence is the belief that violence saves, that war brings peace, that might makes right. This is the myth of redemptive violence. This is the, this is the persistent idea that if there's a bad guy, all you need is a more powerful good guy. I'm going to say that one more time. If there's a bad guy doing bad stuff, all you need is a more powerful good guy. And the more powerful good guy will simply operate by precisely the same actual principles as the bad guy. He's just stronger. So the bad guy is always defined in the story as violent. The bad guy is always defined as what? And the good guy is always defined as more violent. And this is the myth of redemptive violence. Walter Wink goes on, he says, violence never stops violence. Why not? Because its very success, the very success of the good guy to use violence to conquer the bad guy. Are you tracking with me tonight? Okay, (laughs) violence never stops violence because its very success does what? It leads, it leads others to imitate it. Well, that was amazing how you conquered evil with guns and bombs. Let us get some guns and bombs, and we'll conquer evil too when it threatens us. My son Jason, in a conversation we were having about the myth of redemptive violence, he said it so clearly that I said, you got to say that again, and I recorded it on my phone. And then I transcribed it. He said, the worst thing about evil, Dad, is that it convinces good people to do bad things to combat it, and they thus become the evil they are fighting. And in this way, evil perpetuates itself. It is an insidious contagion, this thing called violence. And what makes it all the more insidious is when violence is conducted under the illusion that it is redemptive, that it will solve the problem, that it will extinguish evil. If you can just bomb them, shoot at them, kill them, well, evil will vanish from the face of the earth. And it never does. Even after World War II, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the supreme commander of the Allied forces in Europe, yeah, that guy, who then proceeded after being the general and the supreme commander, became the president of the United States, the 34th president of the United States of America. Once World War II was, was, was done and societies were rebuilding and he had moved through his presidency, He gave his farewell address as as having been the president, and this is his final statement to the United States of America and to the world, his farewell address in 1961. In this farewell address, which I encourage every human being to read, if there's anything um, that I can urge upon you this evening, it is to just Google this farewell address and read the whole thing. It is one of the most profound presidential departure speeches you will ever read of any leader in history because he, having been on the front lines and having been very familiar with war, had some pretty profound things to say. And he coined a term that I'm almost certain you have heard before. Let's see if you've heard this term before. So he, in his farewell address, says, You know, we annually, speaking of Americans at this point, the United States of America, we annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of of all United States corporations. So, you know, everything from, you know, Kellogg Corporation, we don't have wheat bix, we're just messed up that way, but we have Kellogg and, and everything from Kellogg to 
Pepsi to Coca-Cola to, to every tobacco company. At that time, tobacco was a, a big, I mean, you just name it. You take all the corporations of the United States of America, and we were spending more on military security than the collective whole of all American corporations. Now, if that doesn't like give you some kind of pause, then you're not really processing how serious a matter this is. Well, Eisenhower understood how serious it is. He went on and he said this. Now, this conjunction of an immense military establishment, please track with his language, and a large arms, what's that word? Say that word out loud. A large arms Industry. What is that word? What does industry mean? What, like, if you look up industry in the dictionary, what is industry? Yeah. Doing, making something for sale. Thank you. <laughs> the whole point of industry is to make something and sell it. And so there's something here that he, he is identifying as the arms industry. Now, this, this is a new development at this point in American history in 1961. World War II gave rise to something he's calling an arms industry, and he's saying the conjunction of these two things, a big military and an arms industry, listen, is new in the American experience. Up to this point in history, the whole goal was to have as small of a military as possible just to barely defend yourself if evil were to try to encroach upon you. Okay, but a whole bunch of really kind of diabolically smart people with high IQs and low moral Q, I made that up, a lot of people said, whoa, we can sell a product called weapons and make more money than we can make on tobacco or food or education or pretty much anything. So then Eisenhower goes on, he says, we recognize the imperative need for this development. Now, you know, that's disputable. I'm not going to take time to give you my reasons why it's disputable, but he, you have to remember, is coming out of World War II, so he's a little bit shaking in his boots, right? He's thinking, wow, that was heavy. World War II was a pretty serious event in human history. Would you agree? So he's saying, you know, it is necessary, this development of an arms industry, I guess, yet, and this is where the profound wisdom comes, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. The grave implications of what, everybody? I want to make sure you're with me tonight. The grave implications of a large standing military and an arms industry. He's saying, this is serious business. Well, why is it so serious? Well, he goes on and he tells us, our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved in what? In the arms industry. <laughs> okay? So it is, so is the, and so is the very structure, the very structure of society. The very, the, you wake up every day and you say to yourself, I'm an American, and that now means something. The very structure of the way we think, our self-view, the way we process our national identity in comparison to all the other nations. There is a very deep psychological, structural change that he is warning could very well take place. And then he says this, in the councils of government, we must guard against. Now, I stopped there on purpose for emphasis. I really want you to get the next slide. He says that in the councils of government, we must guard against what? Well, here's what we must guard against. The acquisition of unwanted influence, whether sought or unsought, by, and here's the term that he coined, that I think you may have heard before, the military-industrial complex. The military 
industrial complex. He says, we must never let the weight of this combination, what combination? Oh, this is just amazing. We must never let the weight of this combination, what combination? Money to be made off of war. We must never let the weight of the combination of weapons manufacturing combined with, well, if you're a weapons manufacturer, what do you need for your business to boom? If you make wheat vix and so good and all the other things we heard about, what do you need? You need hungry people who want to have breakfast. If you're an arms manufacturer, what do you need for your business to boom? You need war. You need war in order for your business to boom, to be viable. Well, this is amazing. He says we must never let the weight of this combination endanger. This is so discerning. I can't even tell. This is almost prophetic. The level of clarity that he had in this moment. He says we must never let the weight of the combination of money and weapons endanger our liberties or our democratic process, our elections. The process by which a person is chosen to be the president. And then he says this, because every gun that is made, this is 1961, y'all. Every gun that is made, every warship that is launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who are hungry and are not fed those who are cold and are not clothed. It's diabolical and it's universal in American consciousness. We, didn't even, we don't even know. We wake up as Americans. We can't have a NFL football game that does not have fighter jets flying overhead so we can all applaud that does not have people in military uniforms march out on the green before the game. It is a multi-billion dollar industry that involves marketing campaigns, manufacturing facilities, and Eisenhower saw it. Well, simultaneously, this is 1961 that he's saying these things, Simultaneously, the civil rights movement was in its peak of beautiful perfection in defending the rights of people of color. And Martin Luther King Jr. said, in my opinion, something that if I could just like ex cathedra, if I was like the Pope and I could just make it a Bible verse, I would. So I could just quote it to you with authority. Okay, so. I just say that so you know that I'm in, in, from my perspective, theologically, I think this is one of the most profound things in the course of a single sentence that has ever been spoken. Unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. And in this single sentence, King was discerning that there is a kind of power in the gospel that transcends every other notion of power that this world assumes is power. So where are we at with this military-industrial complex? Well, Eisenhower was correct. His warnings should have been heeded, and they were not. Because America is now and has been for some time the world's largest arms dealer. In 2015 alone, and we're down here in 2020, the U.S. sold more than $46 billion worth of weapons to foreign markets so that people could wage war against one another. $46 billion. Do you know how big that number is? I don't know how big that number is. I actually have an idea because I did some math. So, not 46, what, you wanna know how much $1 billion is? 
One billion dollars? Just one billion. If you made $5,000 a day, a day, $5,000 a day, a day, from the point at which Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, if you made from 1492 $5,000 a day until this very day, right now today, you would not have a billion dollars. You wouldn't have one billion dollars. This is a massive amount of money, and it is, it is controlling large parts of the globe with a sense that the myth of redemptive violence is the only way for nations to coexist side by side. Now, just to put it in perspective, just how massive post-World War II, okay, the U.S. military has become, most nations, you would expect this, have uh, military bases in their own country, right? It stands to reason. I would imagine New Zealand has a military base somewhere, right? Maybe more than one, okay? But check this out. Everybody, every country has a military base in their own country, at least one, but watch this. There are a few nations that have military bases in other countries, just a few, it's a short list. England has 16 military bases outside of England. France has 15 military bases outside of France. Russia has nine military bases in other countries outside of Russia. The United States of America has 600 plus military bases in other countries outside of the United States of America. 600 military bases. I don't know, I didn't do the research, there's probably one here. I don't know. I know there's one in Australia. The United States is a kind of universal military police force, in quote marks. And it's frightening. America is the largest, most powerful, most wealthy financial war machine in human history, bar none. The, man, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, Alexander the Great with all his conquests doesn't even come, not a close second. The United States of America is an anomaly in human history in sanctifying war and violence as normal human engagement. Here's how big the numbers are. I don't know if you can even see this, but the United States of America spends about 590, let's just call it $600 billion a year on weapons and military build up. The next seven largest countries with militaries, that's largest spending on weapons and military, are China with $215 billion, Saudi Arabia, Russia. I mean, the next seven add up to less than. The next seven most powerful military powers in the world don't equal the amount of money the United States spends on its military. Are you sensing the overwhelming disparity in power on this planet? Now, in every election in the United States of America, I'm not picking on this guy, but every, I'm, seriously, please don't take this personal. Anybody who you have political leanings, you know, up, down, left, right, you know, straight to hell, to heaven, whatever your military or your political leanings are, don't take offense to this, I'm making a point, okay? This isn't a political point I'm making, I'm here to preach the gospel. So every, doesn't matter if it's on the Republican, conservative side of the spectrum, or the Democratic or the liberal end of the spectrum, doesn't matter, they all come up to every election and one of their main selling points is this. Leading up to his election, he said, we've got to make America strong again. Okay, I just gave you the numbers on how absolutely overwhelmingly massive the American military is, okay? But he says, we need to make America strong again, and right now, we are not strong, believe me. He says that a lot. Don't believe him. Okay, we have a depleted military. We just spent $600 billion on it, but it is 
depleted. We have the greatest people in the world in our military, but it is very sadly depleted, our military is. Is it now? And it, and it wouldn't matter which political ticket, it doesn't matter. Hillary Clinton was saying the same thing. If you elect me, I'll rebuild our military. You know, we have enough nuclear weapons to blow the world up 20 times over. We'll make a few more and we can blow it up like 25 times over. If you vote for me, this is the orientation. It is a kind of corporate, universal, political psychosis. It is a collective mental illness. We are delusional. And we are delusional for a reason. Because there's money to be made. There are corporations who are standing behind the scenes with billions of dollars that they are willing to put in the direction of any, mili any political campaign, Republican, cons Democrat, it doesn't matter. If you promise to spend more money on what we manufacture, namely weapons, we will support your campaign. We don't care what you believe, but we will support you financially. Okay, this is all very depressing, so let's preach the gospel now. Okay. So you remember we began with the universal narrative that we described as the power over others orientation in which the hero uses force to fight evil, to fight the enemies, right? This is the American mantra, by the way. We always operate on the assumption that if we as a nation go to war, it's because we're the good guys fighting the bad guys with violence, okay? I'm gonna to suggest to you, I'm gonna more than suggest to you, I'm going to attempt to build a case here in the minutes that we have remaining, that there is in history this universal myth, the myth of redemptive violence that shows up everywhere, 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 it doesn't matter if it's Zeus or Superman. The ideology is the same. Might makes right. Violence is the only way to conquer evil. And then I'm going to suggest to you that there is a single counter-narrative in history. There's one hero that is unlike all the others. And this one hero that is unlike all the others operates on what I'm going to refer to as a power under orientation. This, this hero is not trying to stand over others with exacting, coercive, violent power. This hero is coming under people in an attitude of service. And this hero uses love, non-coercive love, non-violent love to fight evil. When Jesus came to this world, in that context, in the context of the universal myth of redemptive violence, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan form, papal form, divided Europe, stone cut without hands, smites the image of the feet, grinds it to powder, grows into an exceeding great mountain that lasts forever. That entire process of one empire after another rising and then how does each empire fall in the prophetic timeline? Babylon falls to Persia by violence. Persia falls to Greece by violence. Greece falls to Rome by violence. Are you tracking? Jesus comes along into the world and he says to the waiting multitudes, who with bated breath are on the edge of their seats, as it were, looking for something to change the script in human history. John the Baptist and Jesus both say the same thing. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is now here. It's a political statement. It is a deliberate usage of the word kingdom. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven 
is now here. I, I've arrived, and I'm about to establish a kingdom, a political regime, a empire. I'm about to launch something, and the question is, will it be just more of the same? Well, the word repent is very interesting in this context. We, in our puritanical, you know, post-Reformation orientation, we almost always think that the word repent refers to me, the individual, repenting behaviorally of my behavioral sins. Well, the word repent is metanoial in this verse, and it means to change your thinking. Now, I'm not suggesting that there aren't some behavioral sins that people are committing that they need to stop committing. I'm not in favor of continuing on in sin. Are you tracking with me? But hear me that in this context, the statement is, listen to the statement again, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here now. Change your thinking. Your expectations for what a king ought to be like are not going to be met. Your expectations for what a kingdom ought to be will not be met. You need to undergo a paradigm shift in your perception of what it looks like to be a king with a kingdom. You need to change your thinking. The intent of the passage in its historical context is to suggest that Jesus came into the world as a script-flipping Messiah. Now, please track with me for a minute here. All of the disciples, and these were the cream of the crop. These were, the, these, these were his posse. This was his inner crew, right? These were the guys, and all of them to a man wanted and expected a military Messiah. Every one of them was, was waiting for the moment when Jesus would finally, finally, what would he do? He would fight. He would assert his power. He would ascend to the pinnacle of political greatness. He would be enthroned. He would kick some Roman hind end, and he would exalt Israel to the pinnacle of military greatness, and nobody would mess with Israel again. We're going to make Israel great again. So that's what they expected. That's what they wanted. That's what they, they were, any minute, he's going to do it, right? He's going to do it, right? John, he's going to do it. James, he's going to do it, right? He's going to, they're just, wait, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He never did it. And here's what he actually did. Now track with this. Jesus began teaching, and he said some rather explicit things. And I'm just going to give you a sampling of what he said. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus got right to the point, and he says, You know, I mean, just the beginning of this statement is profound. You know. We all know. We all know without anybody telling us what Jesus is about to say. We all know because it's universal. It's the universal myth. We all know. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, all the other nations of the world, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Egypt, Assyria, name it. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, well, they lord it over. Notice the language. They lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. What did we say the universal narrative is? Point number one, the power over orientation to others. Jesus says, well, you know this. This is how it operates. This is, this is the script. This, everybody's thinking this way. We're all doing life this way. You know how it operates. It's all about power. It's all about who has the power. It's all about dominating others to get your way. You, you know this. And then Jesus says this profound thing. Yet it, it, well, we just read what it is. What is it? Power over others. It shall not be so among you. Who's you? 
my followers. Well, the disciples in the local historical sense, but anybody who names the name of Jesus. It shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great, here's the script flipping idea. Jesus is saying, okay, you, you like this whole di- idea of greatness. And then what is he going to do? He's going to take the vernacular. He's going to take the concept. He's going to take the word. And he's just going to turn it on its head. He's just going to reinterpret the thing that we have a universal interpretation of. He says, whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. He just redefined greatness. That happened for me the first time I came to... Uh, to New Zealand, I went in one of your gift shops. I think it was in the airport. This was years and years ago. I've been coming here for a lot of years to New Zealand. And the first time I came here years ago, there was this kind of you know, tongue-in-cheek thing on a, a mug, on a shirt, on a bumper sticker, whatever, all this stuff that you guys had over here. Welcome to the top of the world. I didn't take it personal. But here's the thing. If you travel south far enough you end up at the top of the world don't you because in the moral social economy of jesus the way up is actually down if you want to be great here's the way you do it you come under people You don't come over people. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, your servant, just as the Son of Man himself, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Nobody in all of history has ever said things like this. Jesus is so beautiful, so amazing, so completely other than what we expect that we don't know what to do with him, so we crucify him. He doesn't fit any of our political categories. He doesn't side with any political regime or party. Jesus stands a towering figure above all the power dynamics of the world and shames all of it by his non-coercive love. Jesus is the one counter-narrative in history. Even Friedrich Nietzsche, the atheist who coined the term God is dead, looked as Joseph Campbell did in A Hero with a Thousand Faces, long before Campbell, Nietzsche came along and he also assessed all, he was brilliant. He assessed all the worldviews, philosophies and religions, everything on the whole spectrum. He looked at everything the world had to offer, Nietzsche did. And he was baffled by one incomprehensible outlier. Watch this. Modern men, Nietzsche says, hardened as they are to all Christian terminology, no longer appreciate the horrible extravagance which, for all ancient taste, lay in the paradox of the formula. God on a cross? Do you hear what Nietzsche is saying? He's saying we're so far removed as modern humans from what Christianity really is in its first manifestation in the person of Christ that we no longer appreciate the horrible extravagance of this notion that the most powerful person in the universe is the one hanging on that cross. That God is on a cross. And then he says this, never before in all of history, before Jesus, he's saying, never before had there been anything anywhere, had there been 
anywhere such an audacious, and here's the word, inversion. What does the word inversion mean? Yeah, turn it inside out, like your, like your, your britches coming out of the dryer, inverted. You've got to go to all the trouble to turn them, the, right? Now you have an image. You'll never forget what we talked about tonight. <laughs> okay, so never before had there been anywhere such an audacious inversion. What is he talking about? Never anything, he's saying never anything like Jesus. Never anything so terrifying, so challenging, so challenging, challenging, challengeable as this formula. What's the formula? He just said it. God on a cross. Nothing like this, he says, in all of history. And it promised, this language is profound, a transvaluation of all ancient values. Jesus, Nietzsche is saying, Jesus turned the entire power dynamics of the world upside down and redefined everything. I'm going to say it to you this way. Power is completely reframed, redefined in the person of Jesus Christ. It's astounding what we witness in him. Paul comes along and he says, you know, God on a cross, it's foolishness to the Greeks because they only understand power over dynamics. And it's a stumbling block to the Jews because they wanted a military Messiah because they, as the followers of Yahweh, had bought the bill of goods from all the other nations that power over is the only way forward. So Jesus comes along and Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross of Calvary is the most powerful force ever released into the world. When Jesus died on the cross, he demonstrated that forgiveness is the way to repair the world, not violence. The death of Christ was, as it were, shock therapy for a world addicted to violence. So in order, and this is the proposition I'm going to make to you this evening, I'm going to challenge your Christianity and mine. In order to follow Jesus, you and I must undergo a complete reorientation on the landscape of reality. To follow Jesus is not a simple, say the printer's, sinner's prayer so you can go to heaven when you die or at the resurrection if you're a Seventh-day Adventist. You, you, say the right, you say the incantation so you can get out of trouble and go to the good place when it's all said and done. I mean, there's some truth to that. Not a lot, but there's some truth to that. Okay, The real thing that Jesus brought to the world was a complete reframing of all human relationships on the premise of non-coercive love and forgiveness over violence. It is not possible to be an authentic follower of Jesus and to be a part of any, in your loyalties, military industrial complex that this world has to offer. The script of kings down through history has always been the same. The king marshals an army and declares war, rides out front on a stallion with a sword in hand, and kills his enemies with a battle cry on his lips. This is on repeat, repeat, repeat down through history. And then there's the Jesus script in which the king doesn't marshal an army, but a group of pupils disciples that he's going to teach. He rides out in front on a donkey. It is a deliberate act of theater. Jesus is engaging in a parody here. He's saying, you want a king? I'll give you one. Bring me a donkey. Not a stallion. And he voluntarily dies at the hands of his enemies with a prayer of forgiveness on his lips. Jesus was the king nobody expected. The question for you and me is, is he your king? For all that he contains, 
in his character and the principles of the relational dynamics that he operates by. Jesus came in the world turning water into wine at a wedding celebration, announcing the kingdom of God is here. Jesus came playing with children, announcing the kingdom of God is here. Jesus came healing the sick, announcing the kingdom of God is here. Jesus came touching the untouchables and saying, it's here. This is the real kingdom. He came socializing with outcasts and saying, this is the kingdom of God. This is what it looks like. Jesus came into the world forgiving sinners and saying, this is what the heart of God looks like. Jesus came teaching us to forgive our enemies announcing the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came teaching us to go the extra mile, explaining what the kingdom looks like. He came teaching us to serve people, not to rule over them, announcing what the kingdom of God looks like. Jesus came teaching that down is the way up, announcing his kingdom. Finally and ultimately, Jesus came dying on the cross in a supreme act of self-sacrificing love, saying, Father, forgive them even as we were corporately murdering the Son of God, announcing this is what it looks like for the kingdom of God to be launched in the world. My question to me, to you, this evening is really quite simple, but it's the greatest challenge I think that we can ever, ever undergo. The question is simply this. Is this Jesus the kind of Messiah that you want? Father in heaven, I pray, Father, that you would help us to want this very Jesus who came to the world 2,000 years ago. I pray that you would uproot from our hearts every desire and impulse to dominate, to control, to coerce, to manipulate others. Father, save us from everything dark inside of us, everything violent, and flood our hearts with your love. In Jesus' name, amen.